Today's chalice lighting by Coretta Scott King, the one that said that the, greatest, the greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members, is one that I really took to heart. Many members of this congregation try to embody the value of compassionate community on the regular. However, it isn't always the easiest thing to do. Many of us, after all, are raised in environments that perpetuate an individualistic focus that diminishes our sense of greater connection and community. This dilution of empathy can sometimes empower us to feel good about our efforts in justice making so long as we are allowed to remain relatively comfortable. For example, we can gather for a meal together, but don't ask me to prepare it. Or yes, of course I'll come to the Bid for Love auction event next week, but I think I'm gonna skip the youth service since it won't pertain to me anyway. Or maybe it's, yes, I'll show up to voice my disdain for the latest racial equity effort of the congregation, but I can't be bothered to sit in my discomfort and really question where that discomfort comes from. Or maybe it's, yes, I'll support the Rainbow Community Center, but the singular use of the pronoun they is just too much to ask of me. Now before anyone feels offended or thinks that I'm calling people out in a shameful way from the pulpit, I want to be very clear. I am. <laughs> I'm calling myself out. These are all things that I have done in the past or continue to do in my present, even in my best moments. If you should find commonality in any of these personal examples, welcome. You are human, you are complex. We are all part of a community and compassion is of paramount importance. This doesn't mean that we get to do anything we want or say anything we want, but it does mean that we can choose connection and empathy and care about our interactions, even if we don't quite fully understand everything. I believe as Unitarian Universalists, we know that the path to our collective salvation is long and tedious, and it's messy, messy, messy. We always say that, but it's like we forget about it when it actually happens. I believe a huge part of community care and connection is to embrace the mess, not to be afraid of it. There likely isn't some mystical time of rapture or messianic emergence without our active and careful participation in it. We are a congregation dedicated to the works of the larger world, and there are so many ways to engage, including inside our own community. I'm very grateful to the members of the Economic Food and Housing Justice Ministry team who've contributed to the planning, execution, and support of the service and the works of the church. Here now are some of those people telling us how their compassionate engagement has helped them in community building. Hello, my name is Ronna Miller-Owen. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I want to share an experience I had helping winter nights. The last time I helped, there was a young girl who wanted to do some activities with me. I taught her how to crochet, starting with chain stitch, and then doing single crochet. She went wild with it and created her own little purse right then. I was amazed at her creativity and it was a wonderful night that I will always remember. Hello, my name is Leslie Rywich and I wanna tell you when I lived in Sacramento, I was a caseworker at the transitional housing program very much like the one we have here at Trinity. The joy, the wonderful feeling a family has when they're chosen 
to have help in learning how to take care of their own place after living with their children in their car or out on their street or in a shelter. It's just an overwhelming, wonderful feeling to be involved in a program like that. I hope all of you have an opportunity to experience that kind of feeling and connection. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Carl Livingood. <clears throat> and what I'm going to be talking about is my experience as the lead cook for Winter Nights. Um, I, I've sort of lost count, but I think three or four times over the past number of years. It's been a very um, interesting and rewarding experience in that I'm, um, I'm actually cooking a meal <clears throat> and or helping organize others to prepare it. So I'm, I'm doing something physical and which I like to do and it's something that is providing warm food for people in need. And for me, this has been a wonderful experience. And feeding them, feeding the people and sitting down and talking with them at dinner is also part of that experience. So it's, it's more than just the cooking and so forth, but it's the meeting of the folks um, and having a little time with them at uh, while they're eating at the table. The other thing that happens is we create a, a small group of folks working together. Hello, I'm Mary Helen Binger, and I am really delighted to share with you my experience um, working with the Winter Nights program. Um, I joined it this year as part of uh, two dinner teams, uh, not even the lead, just uh, a humble part of the process of putting together um, a simple meal for the people that we're serving. It was a great joy to be a small part of a program to provide housing and stability for families in our county, to be part of something larger than myself, something uh, that the church involved the whole church community, and in fact involved uh, the larger interfaith uh, community in Contra Costa County. I appreciated the clear boundaries that were um, laid down for us, uh, which reminded me of my limited role. Um, I was there just to put together um, a simple dinner and serve it to the, to the people and maybe sit and have some conversations um, with, with them or, or not. Um, my role was limited and it was, uh, I needed to remember that I wasn't there to rescue anyone. Um, the other great joy was working with other people um, on the dinner team. Um, you know, I live alone, as many of us do, I think, and um, it was really a delight to be cooking with other people, to be sharing, uh, sharing tasks, and um, that was especially true this year because my um, my granddaughter Raven came and um, and joined me in one of those dinners and brought one of her friends that um, I was just getting to know, um, and they they it was really wonderful watching the two of them pitch in in ways that uh, were unique to them, doing things that that they could do to, to contribute to this um, worthy task. I'm Peter Morse, pronouns he, him, and I'm gay. 
During COVID, I am delivering food from the Monument Crisis Center to LGBTQ plus appliance of the Rainbow Community Center. When delivering, I generally try to check in on the health and happiness of these clients. However, the latter isn't always easy to gauge as folks are generally happy for the food and generally happy to see someone. Two of my deliveries are approaching 100 years of age. One lives in a tidy public housing community and another in a weather-worn home along the bay margins. Their life stories are well worth publishing, but they're out living their friends and families. I learned recently that the first question a South Korean may ask anyone is their age, as they generally revere those senior to themselves, an admirable cultural trait as I age. The hunger rate in South Korea is 2.5%. For the U.S., it's 10.5%. To address this staggering hunger problem that we have both locally and in the U.S., I can think of no better policy than implementing a basic minimum income so people could afford to feed themselves. Thank you. Hello. A few years ago, I volunteered for White Pony Express. It was it was founded by the Minister of Sufism Reoriented in Walnut Creek. She realized that there was both hunger and food abundance in the county, but no connection between them. So White Pony Express was founded as a nonprofit, and they became, became the Ponies Express to pick up, sort, and deliver food by cars and trucks. They collect and accept donations of excess inventory from grocery stores, restaurants, and other food sources. They've also expanded into donations of clothes, books, and toys. They give to 120,000 families each year. By volunteering for them, I was touched by the need for food in this affluent county. My partner and I delivered to the Trinity Center, Salvation Army, Senior Adult Centers from Pittsburgh to Arenda, churches and shelters. I'm grateful to have become aware of the reality of the need and glad I could contribute a few years to the effort to make a difference in people's lives. Thank you. Goodbye. Good morning, my name is Jean Evans. My pronouns are she and her. A few years ago, while living in New York, I participated in an outreach program to the homeless in New York City called Midnight Run. Run. Along with other members of my local UU church, we would regularly drive into Manhattan, take food, clothing, and toiletries to a few predetermined locations. At each stop, there would be a group of people waiting for us. For us. The leader of the run was stressed to us repeatedly how the most important thing we gave these people was human connection, since most of the time people living on the street are ignored, made to feel invisible, they're dehumanized. So after distributing food and clothing, we spent a good chunk of time just chatting with and listening to folks and delivered that most important commodity of all, human connection. During those conversations, I'd always be struck by how similar we were. I also learned how completely devastating it is not to have housing. During the Winter Nights program at MDUUC last month, I had opportunities to connect with the people who were being temporarily housed here. One of my favorite moments happened after sharing meatloaf and conversation with a mother and her eight-year-old son. The boy asked me if after dinner I wanted to play. I said, sure. And soon we were tossing a ball back and forth across Borton Hall. After a few minutes, his mother joined us and we played a short game of keep away. There was laughing and for a little while, there was most certainly connection and community.
As you can see, MDUUC is deeply connected to our county organizations like Trinity Center, Monument Crisis, Winter Nights, Pony Express, the Interfaith Council of Contra Costa County, Faith in Action East Bay, and so many others. The works of this congregation are based on empathy and compassion. They aren't accidental. It is intentional work that starts in the hearts of each of you. In one way or another, this kind of service work can only happen when our egos are engaged and our individualism is sacrificed. Last year, a group of public health and psychological researchers from Israel, Yale, and Switzerland collaborated on a review of COVID-19 public health measures that combat the transmission of the virus. They scored a sample of 34 countries against Hofstede's individualism scale, and then worked to correlate the country's level of individualism to their COVID-19 deaths per million. I bet you never thought you'd see a scientific graph in church. I love being you, you. This graph shows you that correlation, the line is demonstrating that even when controlling for confounding multiple variables in their model, the countries with high individualism experience the highest rates of COVID deaths and transmissions, infections. Both of those were statistically significant. Our care for one another has real world impact. It can literally be life-saving. And this is but one socio-epidemiologic study of its kind that demonstrates the importance of combating unchecked individualism at the expense of our greater community. Empathy and compassion are key tools in all of us understanding the plight of others. We need more of this highly, highly empathetic feels to combat this individualistic society. Without it, Horrible hate crimes like those experienced in the community of Buffalo, New York yesterday are doomed to repeat themselves. I know when I think about these events and others, my sense of overwhelm begins to rise up, and if I'm not careful, it could lead me to inactivity or apathy. I know that if I lean into my care for this community, I can, I can prepare a meal. I know that I will see the value of showing up for our youth. I know that I can combat my own internal racial and gender and sexuality biases and ignorance through self-reflection. Our faith is so cool. It holds all of us accountable to one another through the covenanting process. The covenants are our way of showing care, compassion, and connection with each other. It is the power of our faith. We choose to love one another again and again and again, even when we don't deserve it, or at least feel like we don't. All of our complexities and all of the flaws. These are the symbolic coat of many colors. And if there's ever going to be a time for paradise here on earth, we are going to have to be the ones to make it so.